Welcome to the Fatherhood Challenge, a movement to awaken and inspire fathers everywhere to take great pride in their role and to challenge society to understand how important fathers are to the stability and culture of their family's environment. Now, here's your host, Jonathan Guerrero. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to have you with me. Today, we're going to talk about the purpose-driven father, living out God's plan for your family. This episode is going to be a little bit different than what you're used to, but talking about God's plan for your family is really at the heart of what the fatherhood challenge is about. You know, one of the things I really love about my church is the mission statement. The mission statement says, discipling people in God's love and anti-message empowered by the Holy Spirit to strengthen families in faith and relationship with each other. That's something that is powerful, especially the last part, empowered by the Holy Spirit to strengthen families and faith and relationship with each other. I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little strong, but if your church does not have something about families in its mission statement, you probably have missed the point as a church. And the reason why is because we are created in God's image. So if God has a family and God's whole purpose is for his family, then why wouldn't we as a church put families at the top of our priority? If you aren't discipling your own family, how do you expect to disciple anyone else? outside of your family. So we're going to start at the heart of this, which is fatherhood. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience, my own personal background. One of my guests, my former guest that I had on here was Chris Bruno. Chris taught me something very, very valuable, which is about purpose and identity. Those are the two hearts of what makes a man a man. A man has to know his identity and a man has to know his purpose. Without knowing those two things, a man is completely lost. The identity part is actually broken up into two different parts. The first part has to do with your spiritual identity. And we're going to touch on that as well today. The other part of your identity is your generational identity. I like how Chris refers to it like a generational train. So think of a long train, several rail cars. There's the engine and there's several other cars behind that. Each of those cars represents a generation. You are riding in the front car. So if we go back several cars or several generations of your family history, what's on that train? Is it alcoholism? Is it drug addiction? Is it violence or is it something else? Maybe it's gambling. There's, we could just go on and on and on with this. But the point is there's all of these negative aspects of who you are. It's important to know and be aware of how long that train really is, because that tells you, that gives you a good indicator of what you are up against. So if there's something you need to be dealing with or have your attention on, It might be you get therapy as soon as you can to deal with this issue, because if you're aware of it, you don't want that to continue on to the next generation. You want to be the one that's responsible for putting a stop to it. This is why the generational component of your identity is so important and so critical. So let me share a little bit of mine. My grandfather was and always has been known up until a certain point as being just a very jovial character, somebody who's so much fun to be around. He fell on hard times, and I'm not sure if it was a loss of a job or something to that effect, but when he fell on hard times, instead of turning to God as his source of strength and stability for riding those hard times, like many others, he turned to alcoholism. And when he was drunk on alcohol, he became a raging beast. He became verbally abusive and he became physically abusive. And that led to so many things 
it led to him abandoning his family. And when he was around, he terrorized his wife and he terrorized his kids. And my own father was caught up in this mix. And my father was responsible for eventually keeping the family safe and driving him away and making sure that he did not show up again to to hurt his family. But my dad paid the ultimate price for it because when my grandfather abandoned his family, there was no one around to take care of the family. And so my dad stepped up into the role of being a father to his brothers and being a provider for his own mother. So for a good majority of my dad's childhood, teenage years, and early adulthood, my father became a man before he was supposed to. He never really got much of a childhood at all. He was working all the time. And when he wasn't working, he was home taking care of his siblings and taking care of his mother. So we fast forward to when I grew up as a child without my dad around, always wondering where he was, wondering why everyone around me had a dad, but I was missing mine and trying to make sense of that. If we fast forward into my early adulthood, I decided I really did not want to go much further into adulthood without knowing who my father was. So I finally had a chance to meet him. And that was a a beautiful occasion. I learned so much about my father. It taught me a lot about myself. But the short story is my father did not stick around. In fact, he abandoned me since that first reunion. My father had abandoned me at least three times. During that time, that was a very difficult pill to swallow. But if you ask me now if I regret ever meeting him, I would tell you no, because I learned so much from that experience. I learned great things about my father. I also learned some not so great things about myself. The absence of having a father in my life really tore me up and not really understanding what that was going to mean for me and not really being proactive about taking advantage of that information to try and stop things before things really got bad before I put my family through a lot of stress. Yeah, it didn't happen. My family paid a very heavy and very terrible price for something that has been generations old and something that I did not deal with. And one of the things that really, really messed me up was my view of God. I went through a good portion of my life not really, truly knowing who God was for myself. And in most cases, not really wanting to get to know him. I thought I knew everything I needed to know about him, and it wasn't good. And that was reflected in my own view of my own father who abandoned me. He wasn't around when I needed him to be. Now, There's another part of this that's also true, um, and it took me a while to really grasp this, to swallow it, and to be okay with it, and that is the fact that my own father, when it came to me, he had nothing left anymore to give because he had given everything to his own family just so they could survive. He never got to be a child, and so... A lot of things flip-flop when we lack something in our own childhood. When we become an adult, a lot of times we don't stop looking for what we missed. That became true with my own father. When he became an adult, it was time to be the child that he never got to be. And so he was in no position to take on the responsibility of raising his own child. There was just nothing left. That is one of the prices to be paid for something that was generations old. And it affected me. It affected my own family in a very terrible way. God is good. I look around and I, when I look at my family, I have to be grateful. I can't help but be grateful because I am so painfully aware that that family I have right now should not be here. I should not have the family I have. I should not have the beautiful wife that I have. I should not have the kids I do but they are here. They are very, very much in my life. 
I am very, 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 very wealthy when it comes to my family. It is not deserved. But it is a testimony to God, to who God is and to who God is for me. The fact that he has given me something way beyond what I deserve and truthfully has given me everything that I need to take care of this family that he's given me. So we're going to move on to Malachi 4, 6. Malachi 4, 6 is the mission statement of the fatherhood challenge, and I chose it for a very good reason. Malachi 4, 6 says his preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike a curse on the land. I've learned something that if you see something again in scripture, if it happens again in scripture, it must be really important. But this theme does come about a second time in Luke 1, 17. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the hearts of the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So two times we find this theme of turning the hearts of fathers to their children. Two times in scripture, it must be really important, so we had better pay attention. Now, the very first part, turning the hearts of fathers to their children, that part gives us the warm fuzzies. Most of us, most of us can get behind that and be okay with that. It's the next part that we don't like to talk about. That part is not so much fun to talk about. It's the part where God says, otherwise I will come and strike the land with a curse. So what is this curse? God always meets people where they are. This was written thousands of years ago. People back then believed in in multiple gods. And the relationship of humanity to the gods in the spiritual realm was a very tense relationship. So if something happened to you or something happened to your culture or your people, people around that culture who were outside of that culture would look at your culture and say, well, what did you do to make that God or those gods upset? And people would do this to each other. If there was an individual who fell on bad fortune, other people within that same culture would look at him. And instead of feeling compassion towards, towards that individual, and maybe saying, what can I do to help? They distance themselves. And the reaction was, well, what did you do to anger, to anger your God? So this was the relationship at that time. So in that, in the day and age of Elijah, people had no concept of incarceration, high incarceration rates, mass shootings, things like that. That was not on their radar. There was crime. There was even violent crime for sure. And even that was to the, in their minds, a lot of times attributed to bad fortune that was caused from something you did to anger some God. So when God is saying, otherwise I will strike the land with a curse, that was something that was going to get their attention in their day and age, because it was something they could understand and relate to. But we are here. We are not living thousands of years ago. And yet this scripture remains for us today to read. So what does it mean to us? Where is God meeting us in this day and age? Because the Elijah message is actually a prophetic message. Malachi 4, 6 is a prophetic scripture. It is not something written thousands of years ago that only applies to that civilization thousands of years ago, but it is generational and it applies to us. So we're going to go into the unpleasant conversation and we're going to find truth in it. We're going to talk about the curse. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2020, approximately 19.5 million children under the age of 18 lived in father absent homes in the United States, which is about one in four children. Children living in father absent homes are almost four times more likely to be living in poverty than those in two parent households. That is according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Children living in father-absent homes are more likely to have behavioral and emotional problems, perform poorly in school, engage in drug and alcohol abuse, and experience physical and sexual abuse. This is according to McLehan S. and Sondifer. Fatherless children 
are at a higher risk of incarceration, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. 85% of youth in prisons come from fatherless homes. Fatherless children are more likely to experience physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And that's according to a study by the National Fatherhood Initiative. Children living in single mothers, living with single mothers, are eight times more likely to be abused and six times more likely to be killed by their mother's boyfriend or stepfather. Oh, yeah. And speaking of the mother, women listening to these facts might think, well, what does this have to do with me? The answer is nothing if you were the one who grew up in a loving and stable home or even a broken home where your father was engaged and involved in your life, both emotionally and physically. But for other women who weren't fortunate enough to fall into that category, here's some more facts. Women living in fatherless households are more likely to live in poverty. And that's according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Female-headed households had a poverty rate of 24.7% compared to a poverty rate of 6.5% for married coupled households. Women living in fatherless households are more likely to have lower levels of education attainment. And that's according to a report by the National Center for Education and Statistics. Children living in single-parent households, which are predominantly headed by women, are less likely to graduate from high school and less likely to attend college. Women living in fatherless households are more likely to experience poor health outcomes. According to a study published by the Journal of Family Issues, women living in single-parent households are more likely to report poor physical health and negative health behaviors such as smoking and binge drinking. Let's talk about relationships. Women who grew up in fatherless households are more likely to have difficulty forming and maintaining healthy romantic relationships. And that's according to a study published in the Journal of Marriage and Family. Women who grew up in single parent households were less likely to marry and more likely to experience divorce and separation. Girls learn from their fathers what to look for in a boy, holding their dads as the ultimate standard for how they are to be loved and respected and boys learn from their father what it means to be strong and stable emotionally and physically available especially they learn this from how the father treats his wife now let's look at the cursed from a biblical lens first of all you may have heard this phrase when you grew up especially if you're part of the older generation you definitely heard this phrase spare the rod spoil the child the reference to that is Proverbs 13:24. So the Hebrew word for rod is used several times throughout scripture. And in every case when it's used, it's used to describe a scepter. So if we we're, most of us are familiar with the story of Queen Esther. So when Queen Esther approached the king, the king extended his scepter to her and she touched the scepter. So the scepter and Queen Esther's story was a symbol of authority. It was the king asserting his authority and through his authority, authorizing that person to approach and to speak. There is no reference at all that I can find anywhere of a scepter being used to strike someone. It was simply a symbol of authority. So what's being said here is that fathers are to step up and they are to accept their responsibility. Let's talk about responsibility. 1 Samuel 3.11, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I'm going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I have warned him that the judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed, that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by the sacrifices or offerings. So this is essentially a God handing down justice for dereliction of duty by a priest. That is a very, very serious crime. And so what was happening is Eli's sons were doing very disrespectful things uh, to the sanctuary and the way they were handling the sanctuary rituals. Eli was not correcting them, as was his responsibility to do. And so God takes that very, very seriously when 
a man puts whatever duties he has above raising his own family. So that's the spiritual part of the curse. Now, let's talk about what the curse looks like in our day and age. Most of us are very familiar with the Uvalde shooting. It was a very, very terrible time that most of us would rather forget. What was really interesting to me was that after the Uvalde shooting happened, the discussion that went through the news and that circulated through circles at the, around the water cooler at work and other places was over prevention methods. What could we have done to prevent that shooting from being so devastating? So all of this discussion centered around things like gun control and securing our classrooms. What I did not hear anyone talking about was what was going on in the home. We would much rather talk about anything else than what is going on in our own homes. And for some reason, mass shootings are less painful than dealing with our own homes. And that's really, really disturbing and really, really sad. But this is the pulse of where we are as a nation. In an interview with the Daily Beast, Salvador Ramos, Salvador Ramos is the father of the Uvalde shooter. He's quoted as saying, I just want the people to know, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry for what my son did. Okay, sorry for what his son did. So the focus, once again, is on the shooting. But let's continue. I quote again, I never expected my son to do something like that. He should have just killed me. You know, instead of just doing something like that to someone. His son, called Salvador shot his grandmother in the face and then drove away with her car before running the truck into a ditch outside Robb Elementary and opening fire on a fourth grade classroom. A high school classmate, I'm quoting from the Daily Beast, a high school classmate told the Washington Post she had seen Ramos engage in multiple fist fights and a former coworker told the Daily Beast he was inclined towards harassing women he worked with. Another quote from the Daily Beast. He was currently estranged from his daughter. This is the the father. He was currently estranged from his daughter, the gunman's sister, who he said was also upset with him for not spending enough time with the family. And then this is a quote from Ramos, the shooter's father. My daughter, I guess, changed her life. She went into the Navy, he said. I wish my son would have gone and changed his life. So what we're seeing here is really, really sick. The father's daughters, they left for the Navy because he wasn't around for them. They were missing a father in their life. And this is why they went to the Navy. And then we have the father saying that he wished his son had done the same thing. In other words, he just wanted his son to go away. That is unacceptable. This is the curse that God was trying to spare us from. So let's talk about how God feels about fatherhood. If we look at 1 Chronicles 22, 7 through 10, my son, I wanted to build a temple in honor of the name of the Lord, my God, David told him, David's talking to his son. But the Lord said to me, you have killed many men in battles you have fought. And since you have shed so much blood in my sight, You will not be the one to build the temple to honor my name, but you will have a son who will be a man of peace. I will give him peace with his enemies in all the surrounding lands. His name will be Solomon. I will give him peace and quiet to Israel during his reign. He is the one who will build the temple to honor my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. This is God saying that he will parent Solomon. He will be Solomon's father. God wants to do the same thing for you. He wants to do it fully. Let God do that for you because he will not fail you. And I'm the living evidence of that because I grew up without a father in my life. 
And I can tell you without cert, with absolute certainty that God was there for me and he did not abandon me. So if you let him in, he will not abandon you either. Last is one of my favorites. Let's look at Psalm 68, five father to the fatherless defender of the widow of the widows. This is our God whose dwelling place is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. I love that part. Defender of the widows, father to the fatherless. This is our God. I absolutely love that. This is what God has to say about fatherhood. This is how seriously he takes it. And if he takes it that seriously, we should too. There is a big ideal that is placed on fatherhood. We've got a clear picture that fatherhood is right in the middle of of the spotlight of what God pays attention to, of where his heart is, of what he's passionate about. He is passionate like you can't believe about fatherhood. Enough to mention it several times through scripture, enough to step in and become a parent to someone who is going to be without a parent in their life, an involved father. So there is a high ideal placed on it. And we have this picture that God has his eye on fatherhood. That's a little intimidating. That is a little bit scary. If you ask me, the benchmark is really, really high. And so it's tempting to think I can't do this. It's tempting to think the responsibility is too great. I can't handle all this. I can't do this by myself. Oh, and that's the part. That is interesting. Doing it by yourself. What if I told you, you weren't meant to parent by yourself. You weren't designed to do this alone. And I'm not just talking about having a spouse that is helping to parent with you. I'm not talking about just that. I'm talking about spiritual help. You have access to spiritual help in every aspect of your parenting. You were not supposed to do this alone. So why are we trying to? And you have one job. The Holy Spirit will not enter you. He will not occupy you without your consent. So your job is simply to ask. That's it. We make things way too complicated. We make parenting way too complicated. But this whole thing was designed to work with spiritual help. So... Quit trying to do it on your own. Quit trying to do it alone. Ask for help. Your value comes directly from God. He loved you enough to die for you. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to be in every involved in every aspect of your life. He wants to help you parent. And if you grew up fatherless, he wants to be your parent just as he has been for me. So don't shut him out. Don't do this the hard way. Let him in, ask him in, and watch what happens. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fatherhood Challenge. If you would like to contact us, listen to other episodes, find any resource mentioned in this program, or find out more information about the Fatherhood Challenge, please visit thefatherhoodchallenge.com. That's thefatherhoodchallenge.com.